Welcome to the Brain Shape Podcast, hosted by Dr. Andrea Wilkinson, a show where we cut through the noise of the ever-growing, ever-changing world of brain health. What works and what doesn't? What's fact and what's fiction? We look at tips, tools, and techniques backed up by real scientific studies to help you keep your brain healthy and hopefully have some fun along the way. Now, here's your host, Dr. Andrea Wilkinson. You're listening to the Brain Shape Podcast, episode number 33. What is your initial reaction when I say the word shame? How does that word make you feel? For many of us, shame is a bad word, and we would rather avoid it than talk about it. But today's guest, Dr. Sean Horn, enlightens us about a different way to approach shame. Instead of cowering away from shame, she instead invites us to approach it with curiosity. She teaches us about the differences between healthy and unhealthy shame and how the latter is a core root of many of our emotional and behavioral struggles. Dr. Horn provides us with some important insights about how a better understanding of our own shame experiences can help us improve our relationship with ourselves as well as with those around us. But before we get to our interview with Dr. Horn, I want to tell you about a really exciting opportunity to work with me directly. Before I get to telling you about how we can work together, let me first ask you this. Have you ever been in the middle of a conversation and forgotten a name or what that thing is called? It happens to so many people, and I know how frustrating it can be. You want to experience less minor memory slips, especially while in the middle of a conversation. You tell yourself that it's just a normal part of aging. But memory slips and mental fog do not need to be a normal part of aging. Creating a life that supports your mental and physical vitality is within your reach. But there is no magic pill. You have to want it and you have to work for it. In case you don't know me yet, my name is Dr. Andrea Wilkinson and I have a PhD in psychology with a specialization in cognitive aging. I've been studying aging and cognitive maintenance and how our memories change over time for over 15 years and I want to introduce you to my five-step signature methodology, the Brain Vitality Blueprint. Inside my program, I teach you the five steps that you need to follow to create lifestyle habits that optimize your memory, cognition, and physical vitality so you can look and feel energized. The Brain Vitality Blueprint is highly personalized because, let's face it, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to brain health. You are unique, and as such, you have specific and personalized needs when it comes to keeping your brain fit and your body active. The program is for you if you are a retiree who is looking for ways to up-level their lifestyle so they can improve their memory and feel energized. The program is also for retirees who are already knowledgeable about brain health, but they're having trouble executing on what they know they should be doing in their everyday lives. So you need an accountability partner. And so the Brain Vitality Blueprint is the perfect program for you. So if you're interested in creating your own Brain Vitality Blueprint with me personally, I'm now opening a limited number of spots in my program. So what's involved in the Brain Vitality Blueprint? What does this program consist of? Well, I'm super glad that you asked. My signature methodology covers the five steps that you need to follow to optimize your brain health. Step one is a lifestyle audit. So we take an inventory of all of your daily and weekly routines and habits so we can identify which habits are causing the most damage and create replacement routines so that you can optimize your brain health. 
Step two is to get your body moving. You'll learn the science behind physical movement and how it impacts your health and your vitality and your mental functions, and you'll develop a personalized plan on how to incorporate movement into your daily life. Step three is eating for brain health. What you eat is at the core of your brain health. So we will break down the gut brain connection and you'll learn the fundamentals of eating for brain health. You'll learn how to create your plate and build a personalized meal plan. Step four is managing your sleep cycles and your stress. So you're going to learn how stress and sleep both impact your brain, and then we'll cover strategies that you can use to help optimize your sleep hygiene on a daily basis and also help you manage day-to-day stressors in your life. And the last step, certainly not the least, is sharpening your mind. We'll cover the science behind brain fitness and cognitive maintenance, and you'll learn science-based strategies to boost your mental performance, and together we're going to create a personalized brain fitness plan. And I'll be there every step of the way. I truly believe that you need more than information to get transformation, and I structured the Brain Vitality Blueprint accordingly. So in addition to getting the educational video modules, you're going to get one-on-one customized help and support directly from me, Dr. Andrea. We'll have weekly one-on-one calls to ensure that you're learning everything you need to know and to keep you motivated and accountable as you set out to accomplish your goals. So if you're ready to improve your memory, cognition, and physical vitality so you can look and feel energized, and you want to accomplish these goals by working directly with me on a one-on-one basis, then head on over to brainshape.ca. Right there on the homepage in the top banner, you're going to see Brain Vitality Blueprint. Simply click on the Learn More button and you'll be able to read all about the program. And most importantly, book a call with me because we need to get on that call to make sure that this program is the perfect fit for you. I only work with people that I know I can help. So this call is really to make sure that your goals align with what the Brain Vitality Blueprint offers. So remember, there's only a limited number of spots available. So if you are interested, you need to get on that call with me as soon as possible. So head on over to brainshape.ca, click on the learn more button in the top banner under Brain Vitality Blueprint and book that call. I'm so looking forward to chatting with you and guiding you on your brain health journey. Now let's get to today's interview. To inform us about the psychology of shame, we're talking with Dr. Sean Horn, a licensed clinical psychologist and shame expert with over 26 years experience in the mental health field. Dr. Horn has a private practice in Spokane, Washington, is a faculty member at the University of Washington's Medical School, hosts a podcast called Inspired Living, and has a column in Twa Magazine called Connecting the Dots with Dr. Sean Horn. Her area of expertise includes shame psychology as well as positive psychology. Here we go. Here's Dr. Sean Horn. Hi, Dr. Sean Horn. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It is an honor to be here, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you. And I want to know if you can maybe start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background as a clinical psychologist and shame expert. I am a a licensed clinical psychologist in Washington State. I've been in the mental health field now for 27 years. I have a private practice here in Spokane, and I'm also faculty at the University of Washington Medical School, where I supervise the psychiatrists during their residency, as well as having a lot of other things that I'm doing that I'm sure we'll get to. But during during grad school in the mid-90s, I was introduced to shame psychology. 
by one of our faculty members that specialized in it. And when I sat in that classroom and they described shame, I just was completely blown away. I thought, this is it. This is the core of all of our emotional and behavioral difficulties. And I need to understand this more. I need to know how to teach people about it, how to be shame free in my own life with my parenting, my relationships. So I dove deep into shame. And that's how I became a shame expert. I wrote my dissertation on it. Uh, My dissertation was shame free parenting. I also do a lot of public speaking workshops, seminars on the topic of shame. And that's how I became a shame expert. Yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about shame. So what is shame and what is shame psychology? Yeah, I'm going to start with telling you a little funny story. When I wrote my dissertation, I had an opportunity to go and do a seminar. And there was somebody that was there that actually was doing a book with a a publisher, New Harpenger Press. And they told the editor about my presentation. They called me and they said, we want to do a book on shame. Would you be interested? And I said, yes. And so we engaged in this whole process and I wrote this book and we submitted it. And right before it was about to come out to print, they contacted me and they said, you know, we changed our mind because we feel that shame is an aversive topic. People have shame about shame. And so we don't think we can market it. We don't think we can talk about it. And I was so devastated. And that was the first time I was introduced to this idea that people have very strong reactions to the concept of shame, really not understanding it or knowing what it is and thinking it is reserved for these very severe or extreme situations. Now, five years after that event, now we're in the mid 2000s, we have this professional Brene Brown who comes on the scene and she's telling everybody about shame. And so now the public and is more accustomed to that topic and they're talking about it and wanting to know more about it. So I think it's really important that we do define shame for people so they can see that it isn't such a, a, an aversive thing to avoid or not want to look at. And in shame psychology, we say there's two different kinds of shame. There's healthy shame, which is focused on behavior. It's when you make a mistake and you feel that inner conviction and you just go, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. I need to apologize. I need to correct it. And you take the proper action that is indicated to attend to the situation. In that case, shame is helpful, is necessary, and we want people to have a shame response that is appropriate to the circumstance so that they can develop their consciousness, their sensitivity. They can, it's, it supports the empathy function that we have. So this is a good thing. Often people will say that healthy shame is somewhat like guilt or that conviction I talked about. But toxic shame is the message that when you made a mistake, you didn't just make a mistake. You are a mistake. You're flawed. You're defective. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. Something is just wrong with you or some emotion is wrong or some need or feeling or interest. There's something about our life as a human that we associate this message that it's flawed and wrong if I have this human experience. So in this case, shame becomes very toxic because people merge their identity with shame. Instead of it being, this was a problematic situation, it becomes, I am a problematic person. Instead of it, I made a mistake, it's, I am a mistake. I am dumb. I am a loser. I failed. Fill in the blank. Things along those lines. So when it's attached to our identity that way, the problem with that is that when we go through life as adults, we won't separate circumstances from who we are. Everything becomes an extension of us. Our children are an extension of us. Our careers are our our material possessions, our success, our status in life, it's all an extension. If my body is good enough, then I am acceptable. If my wife, my husband, my kids are the right way, they look the right way, dress the right way, have the right degree, then I am a good parent. I'm a good person. I'm a successful person. 
And so we get attached to these pillar, these things in our life that are defining who we are. But when they go away, when they change or there's situations that are out of our control, then we have a crisis. We have this complete crisis of what does this mean about me? And ultimately, it can contribute to suicidal thinking because if the problem is so severe or the circumstance, then instead of seeing it as this situation needs to change, they'll say it's me. My life needs to change. And they'll utilize that thinking as a solution. So toxic shame we see as really a motivator and a core root to many of our emotional and behavioral struggles. And for this reason, we want to attend to that, identify it, educate people about it, and really rewrite those messages, those shame-bound messages that we've attached to in our life. That is very interesting. I'm wondering what you think is the driving force. So for someone who has a healthy shame and so they can dissociate themselves from whatever the situation is and say, this is a bad situation, but I am not a bad person versus the person that it, it becomes intertwined. So this bad thing happened, therefore I am bad. What drives that difference in perception? What do you what, from your experience, what are the contributing factors that creates these two very distinct types of people? Mm -hmm. They say in shame psychology that we experience shame and get these messages in our early childhood experiences, where we mm -hmm. look to this world as, who am I? Am I good enough? Am I lovable, likable? Is it okay that I cry? Is it not okay that I cry? Am I invited into the group? Am I excluded from the group? If I am, why? And our little minds try to make sense of this. So typically what happens is let's say a person communicates an emotion or an interest. And when they did, something bad happened to them. The bad could be they were physically harmed. They were labeled they were rejected, they had love withdrawn from them. So this is where a parent might say, quit your crying, you're being a baby, go to your room, I don't want to hear this, or quit, you're, you're being stupid, or stop that you're whining, or I'll give you something to whine, cry about. Those kind of messages where they get this, wow, I will be rejected, I won't be loved, I won't be wanted, if this part of me exists. And so then we want to get rid of it. We want to get rid of that vulnerable emotion, that vulnerable experience. Or let's look at a classic situation where you have a little boy that wants to be an artist and the father is very threatened by that. Says no child of mine is going to be an artist. You're not, a, um, you're not a girl. And so then the father promotes masculine sports and machismo type activities so that child might do that to please their father, but ultimately they really want to be an artist. They don't want to play football. And so when they become an adult and then they see art, people expressing art, typically we have a, um, an activated response to that. I call it the shark music, that da 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 da. Like we get agitated. We sometimes will oppress other people. We'll tell them that what makes you think you, you can go and do all that? You need to work. You need to be responsible. So sometimes we continue these generational patterns by taking the message we received and communicating it to other people. So it happens when that shark music gets kicked in and we have a disrupted emotion inside is we want to control that feeling and we also want to protect ourselves from exposure. We don't want, I don't want you to see it and I don't even want to see it. And that's where we come up with these distractions in life, these behaviors, these circumstances, emotions to, to redirect our attention away from the shame. So this becomes our unhealthy coping skills. Any too much behavior, working too much, eating too much, drinking too much, fill in the blank. It, some of the obvious things, anger problems, raging, uh, and so forth. But it can be some higher functioning things where people are avoidant of connection. They're overly focused on physical symptoms, migraines, 
ulcers, their health, things along those lines, or they'll actually shame dump where what that means is you reverse the message. So if someone comes to you and says, Hey, why didn't you take care of this chore? Like you said you would. And the person responds with, are you serious? You're really coming to talk to me about that after everything I do for you, you mess up here, you make this mistake. So they start to character assault back. That's a shame dumping dynamic to divert the attention. I don't want to feel like I'm less than. I don't want to feel like I made a mistake. So I'm going to flip it and have a very defensive anger reaction. So what happens is that these parts of us that we get rid of, that we say, I can't have this emotion, I can't have this feeling, this vulnerability, this human quality. And and what also I'll back up, what also contributes to that is having unrealistic expectations where we were told that we should know things we haven't been taught yet, or we should have control over our thoughts and our feelings that our little bodies and brains couldn't do yet. And so we had these unrealistic expectations that we just continued to fail meeting those performance demands because our bodies just were not ready to do that. And then they become an adult and they will continue to have unrealistic expectations for themselves, thinking that they shouldn't grieve. I I often have clients that will have a loved one who has passed away and they'll three months later, say, why am I not over this yet? Well, that's an unrealistic expectation. I mean, I would think you have a good year into your grief. Good year, too. I mean, sometimes it it just is a process. There's no timeline to that expectation. So I find that people need to have those expectations rewritten to understand what does it really mean to be human and that it's okay. And so here we have the person that's trying to get rid of their human experience. And then when they can't control it, they have all these behaviors and emotions that are trying to, to resist it. So like, let's say for example, they're angry, but they resist anger. So it becomes rage. They're sad, but they resist sadness. So it becomes depression. So it expands what we resist persists and it expands. And then the person has the consequence of that on their life. And they say, see, I really am flawed. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I have anger problems. I just verbally abused my family. I really am a problem. And that is how the vicious cycle continues. They take that experience. They try to get rid of it. It spills out. They try to control it and so forth. So that, that is how we see the fundamental dynamic of how shame takes shape with us. It doesn't have to be the parent doing it straight to us. It can be something we also observe vicariously by having a sibling who acts out or a kid in a classroom that is mocked and rejected. And so you have that child that goes, wow, I I don't ever want to be like that. I need to be like this. So it can be things we observe in our environment, or it can be within our family system, or in our culture, in our society, with the rules that are promoted, such as legalistic religious upbringings, and different cultural factors can play a role in that too. So I think it's very obvious why we need to heal from unhealthy shame, but I'm wondering if you could maybe touch a little bit on what's involved in healing from unhealthy shame. Yes, that's an excellent question. So we we do want to educate people and help them understand this is what's happening for you because it really helps that person to be able to step out of the painting. I say you can't see the painting when you're inside the painting. Mm -hmm. So when we step out and we say, we're going to inform you and educate you about why your body is working the way it is, why you are having these behaviors, how it took shape. Now, often people feel that as we expose that or look at that or talk about how their early childhood experiences shape some of these problematic thoughts or beliefs or behavior, often people will feel very guilty. They feel that they're picking on their family or they are doing something bad by talking about their loved ones disrespectfully. And so I tell them that it's not about shaming and blaming. 
our parents, our early life experiences, or even ourselves. Because one of the things that happens when we talk about it is people become very aware of how they continue to do that to their own children. And they have their own grief of, wow, I didn't realize I did that to my family. And so we say it's not about blaming yourself or your family. It's really about identifying what those patterns are. What is your, what parts of you have you denied yourself uh, of? What parts do you have unrealistic expectations with? How do you think about your experience as a person in this world? So we rewrite some of those core beliefs and then we also help them identify their triggers. What kind of things trigger their shame? Because that is going to give us a lot of information about their reactions. And as they become informed about what their triggers are, then they can intervene. So when they do experience a trigger, they say, oh, this is one of those triggers. And then they use the skills that we talk about, such as mindfulness skills, emotion regulation skills, to help them flow with it rather than resisting that experience, trying to control it or meditate on it. So I tell my clients, you don't want to, you don't want to stick to it by meditating, ruminating, and you don't want to resist it. Why? If only shoulda, woulda, could have. you just want it to flow through you. So as the thought comes, it just came and it goes. As that memory came, it just came and it goes. So this is what we teach a lot in mindfulness is how to let your thoughts and feelings flow rather than reacting to everything with these efforts that are not effective. Mm -hmm. So when they can identify those triggers and then they can radically accept that they are having a trigger, that this is just their history talking to them then they can begin to challenge themselves to have a different behavioral response. So we start to look at their defenses. When you get triggered, what are your defenses? And then equip them with new skills and new tools so they can have effective responses rather than ineffective reactions. This is the process of therapy is really helping to sort out where where is the the challenge? That's the assessment piece. How is how do we understand this given your biology, your your thought process, your social experience, your family experience? But now that we know that, we now know what skills and tools that we need to give you so that we can transition from ineffective reactions to effective responses that are more likely to improve the situation, more likely to give you the desired outcomes you want than just trying to fend for ourselves and just throwing stuff out there and seeing what's going to work. I feel that a lot of it also has to do with, and you've already talked about this, but it's this idea of bringing awareness to, because I think a lot of the times people are just reacting to whatever's happening in their lives and thinking that they're just responding to some event. So there's no pattern, but in the context of therapy, it's bringing awareness to these repeated patterns And saying like, you know, if you notice this is happening in this way and bringing the awareness to that response, I think helps enlighten people to what's actually going on. And then through that enlightenment, they can think through some alternative behavioral responses that are more appropriate. Yes. And a a very important key in that awareness and observation is observing and being aware without judgment. Mm-hmm. And so how I describe this to clients, because if you had a shame bound family system, then it's likely that we'll have a very strong inner critic where we'll become angry that we have that reaction, angry that we still get triggered. We'll have unrealistic expectations of, shouldn't I be done with this by now? Why is this still here? Why is this still triggering me? I've done all this therapy. I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70. Why is this happening? And that is all part of how we continue shaming ourselves. So in non-judgment, we're saying you can still describe 
what is problematic, what is harmful, what is going to have a negative outcome and not judge it. Judging is where you're assigning a value to a person for whatever that experience is versus just acknowledging. So like I can acknowledge that I'm with, when I'm with somebody, I don't, really enjoy their company. I don't want to spend time with them. I don't, I don't uh, prefer this person, but if I'm judging them, I'm, I'm making them less than who is that person? I can't stand her. She is so rude. It's when we have that emotional inflammation to it. And so when people become aware that they're judging or aware that they're shaming themselves or they have a lot of inner criticism, they can get stuck there because they'll, they'll struggle with being angry and, and judging their judgment, having shame about shame. And so instead, the shame-free way is letting that awareness inform you so you can go, oh, right, and redirect your attention. It's kind of like someone tapping you on the shoulder and going, hey, what? You're, you're doing that thing. Oh, right. Thank you. And then you redirect. So it's just focusing on that behavior. What do I need to do that's different rather than being really hard on ourselves and have a lot of criticism? And this takes practice. It's a skill that we have to learn and practice. I have so many people say, I cannot do that. I've judged my whole life. And I say, give me three months, three months of practicing this. And you will see the difference. And sure enough, after three months of practicing, it starts to become more natural for them. Yeah. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about any listeners who might not be familiar with the process of therapy. So they might have a little bit of an aversion to it or even the thought of going to therapy. And I think that connects really well to what you just said, that people think, you know, what good could this really have? You know, I'm frustrated mm -hmm. by X, Y, Z. So what's the benefit of going to talk to someone about it. Like it just bothers me. And that's the end of the story. Um, and so there's yeah. kind of this block and this barrier to the other side of the tunnel where someone can be enlightened and can change the inner workings of their mind and some profound distress that they are feeling. So what do you say to people that maybe have this block or barrier when it comes to going to therapy even as a first step? Yes, we will continue to change until the day we die. Every day that we wake up, we have an opportunity to do something different with our brain and to we have an opportunity for hope. And that message that people have that there's nothing wrong with me. If I go to therapy, that means something's wrong with me. If we go to couples therapy, that means we're almost going to get divorced. This is the stigma of mental health. And this is really relevant to a lot of generations like the baby boomers and the generation Xers, they got more of that message than the youth today. The youth today, they say, where did you go to yoga and who's your therapist and let's have coffee. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you know, the way it is, right? Yeah, and yeah so, exactly. But, but as people are in the older generations, they are not as open or feeling as free to do that. Some are, it depends on where they live. They're in a progressive area versus a more conservative area. This can make a difference. So I used to play sports and I like to use a sport analogy for this. If I sat down and someone said, okay, Sean, here's a basketball, go out. This is how you, how you dribble it. This is how you shoot the basket. This is how you play your game. Now here's the ball. Now go. I would have no idea how to do it. Like my head would understand it, but my body would not know how to connect with my head. And even if I started dribbling, I wouldn't be able to do it well. And instead of saying, oh my gosh, I can't play basketball. Look at that. I can't even do it. Instead of doing that, we know that with sports and music and dance, you have to practice and practice and you need your coach that can observe your body, observe your mechanics from an outside perspective to help you have the information you need to master your performance. I cannot see myself on a basketball court. I cannot see myself as I play an instrument, how my body is positioned, but the person outside of me can see it. They have a unique perspective that I will never have. 
And for that reason, it is beneficial to me to invite this person, this coach, this instructor into my life so they can help me refine my skills and master my game. So we cannot see the painting where, when we're inside the painting. We need the, to either step out or have someone on the outside give us this perspective. And the thing about our families and our friends is that they're invested. They have a subjective view of you. They've developed core beliefs about who you are, life. We often hang out with like-minded people, so they might have the same way of thinking as us. And we really don't get a different perspective, a different way of doing something. Imagine if all of the food you ever ate was one type of food and all your friends made that food. If all you made was hamburgers, everybody in your life made hamburgers, everywhere you went was hamburgers, then you think the world is hamburgers. But then somebody shows up and says, let me show you spaghetti. And you're going, what? <laughs> what is this thing? And, and you're exposed to it and you just go, wow, I didn't even know that this could be there. And so this is where it helps to have someone fresh and new who is objective, who can be in that very unique role. I tell my clients, it's unique like your teachers. You have teachers that were, were in your life, your fifth grade teacher or your high school teacher, and they influenced you, they impacted you, they helped you, mentored you. And then when that year was over, that was that function was over. But they are always your teacher. And they're always your mentor. And you will reflect back and thinking about how they served you at that time in your life. And so as therapists, we can do that too. We come into somebody's life at a specific point to give them guidance, support, to help them organize their thoughts and their feelings and to equip them with new ways of doing things. Now, traditional therapy used to be delivered very differently where people would sit and they would just let people talk forever and ever and not give any feedback. Today, we have a lot of different kinds of therapies that some involve that style but some are very active and very engaged and saying, I recognize that you don't know how to play basketball, so I'm going to teach you how to play basketball <laughs> so that you can do it rather than waiting for you to figure it out. And so when people want to go to therapy, it's just really important that they find the right fit. They find someone that they like, that they feel connected to, and really see that it's okay. You don't have to have all the answers. If you expect yourself to have all the answers, then that is a shame-bound expectation. We cannot have all the answers. If we could, we could do our own surgeries. We could fix our own plumbing and repair our own car. We can't do that. That's division of labor. So there are people who have mastered certain information that can be a resource for us. And my goodness, let's utilize it. It's a luxury. It's a privilege. And it's available. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I also find that when people only think of their friend group or family network for talking through problems, people are also oftentimes not as open about some of the things they are facing because they don't want to disclose that to their friends and family. So I also feel mm -hmm. there's that added benefit in addition to the coach who has a whole wealth of knowledge that you don't have that they can help you think through some things, it's also a space where you can be completely open without any fear of, you know, I don't want to tell this one person this because it might get back to this other person. And so there's a, a really safe space that's created between a client yeah. and their therapist, which I think is really valuable. Exactly. So I'm wondering if you can tell us about your new Connecting the Dots column in Twa magazine. So what is that all about? I had the opportunity to write an article for them. And after that, we started to talk about the possibility of having an ongoing monthly column. And my passion was I really wanted to educate people on the reasons why they're feeling what they're feeling. I find so often when people come in, they don't realize that there might be other reasons for their mental health symptoms. They're having a struggle and a mental health challenge, 
but they may not be aware that their body might be contributing to it. A health condition could be contributing, a circumstance, a learning disorder, some other situation that isn't their intention or their will or their character. Most of the time when people struggle with mental health, they think it's because they're not trying hard enough. They're not making, they're not choosing to be happy. They're uh, being lazy. They're something's wrong with them, that kind of stuff. But then when they come and see psychologists and, and medical providers, we will assess them and say, you know, it's sounding like you actually might have a problem with your thyroid. Let's go and have that looked at. Or, you know, your heart palpitations might be due to having really low potassium levels. So let's get some lab done and lab work done and check that out and make sure that your potassium, magnesium, and zinc is where it needs to be because that might be contributing to your anxiety. So when we get that information, it can really help nip stuff in the bud so you don't go years and years and years trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Why can't I get rid of this condition? Because the, the cause of it is not being investigated. Some people say they're depressed, but you find out they're not eating or they're anxious all the time and you find out that they're eating candy and sodas and drinking coffee all day long. If people do that, they're going to feel anxious. Or maybe they have a sleep disorder. Or what I often find in men, especially, you don't expect to see it so young, but I do see it starting to happen in men's lives in their 30s, is they begin to get drops in testosterone. And when they get drops in testosterone, they get these blues. They just kind of feel ugh, like life is unmotivated. They have problems sleeping. They start snoring. They get mid-body weight gain. They start to lose hair. I mean, they're just not feeling so good. But they'll come in and they'll say, well, I, I don't have low testosterone because there's nothing wrong with my, my drive, my sexual drive. And it doesn't have to express itself that way. But what it could be expressing itself is in just not feeling well, not feeling alive and vital, feeling irritable, having a hard time concentrating and so forth. So if any man is struggling with mental health, I'd like to have their testosterone looked at. So you really want to have a, a good medical workup done to, to rule out any other factors that could be contributing to their experience. So my connecting the dots column is really addressing those subjects. It's addressing the stigma and how that might be playing a role in our mental health, how our physical components can, environmental, family, social, all those things could be contributing so that people have realistic expectations about themselves rather than thinking they shouldn't be having this problem and continuing to shame themselves with that unrealistic expectation. And so if any of this is resonating with the listeners and they are experiencing some symptom, but they're not sure if there is potentially a physiological underlying cause, what do you suggest they do to help tease apart whether there's this cause and effect relationship happening? They can go and see a psychologist that I like, I like providers who are focused on functional medicine, that they incorporate not only Western medicine, but they also look at more what we call functional or naturopathic interventions. So they will look at how to heal the person from the inside out, looking at things like your gut health your nutrition, your lifestyle, are you moving your body? Are you drinking water? Are you, uh, what's happening with your health from a holistic point of view? So I like psychologists or providers who have that line of thinking and also providers like doctors, medical doctors that will investigate those things. Now, some doctors won't. You go in and you say, I'm anxious, depressed, and the first thing they do is give you medicine straight out the gate. But that can be problematic. So you want to have someone that's going to say, all right, let's get a full wellness panel blood work done on you and look at all of your numbers of your thyroid, your hormones, your uh, your." iron levels, your vitamin D levels, 
all those things so that we can make sure that all those are right where they should be. And then we can decide what we want to do for intervention. We might give you a nutritional intervention. We might give you some supplements, uh, come up with an exercise plan, target your sleep. Maybe you need a sleep study done. And so you come up with a plan. And then from there, you start to see kind of, is this working? Is it not? I tell my clients, it's similar to having diabetes one or two. When you have diabetes two, you can change it with nutrition, lifestyle interventions, but sometimes you can't and you need that insulin. And so then you have that intervention. So sometimes we do need to use psychotropic medications, but if we can affect it in this other by from the inside out, we definitely want to try that. But if that doesn't work, then we might look at medication. So having a team, having a therapist that can do that assessment at who's also working with a medical provider who will do a holistic functional medicine evaluation of your overall health would be ideal. And if anyone's interested in reading your column, Connecting the Dots in Twa Magazine, where can people go to read it? What's so great about Twa is that it is free and it's online and it's international. So they can go to twa.com and read it online. I recently went onto the website and I saw that previous issues were not available anymore. So I think the current issue is available, but once they release the next one, then you may not be able to go back to previous ones, but you can order it and you can also get a subscription to be delivered to your own residence. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Horn, I want to thank you so much for you spending the time with us today and sharing so much important information about shame and the difference between healthy and unhealthy shame and how it is that we can go about trying to uncover our our deepest, darkest and how we can go through some processes to help us live a better, um, more productive life. And so I just want to thank you so much for your time. And I'm wondering if you, if the listeners want to get in touch with you, where's the best place they can go to find you? They can go to my website, www.drshawnhorn.com. And they can also hear my podcast, the Inspired Living Podcast, which you can find on iTunes and Google Play. And what I'm really excited about with my podcast is that you are going to be one of my guests coming up soon. (laughs) Yes, I am. I'm so excited to be a guest on your podcast. I'm really looking forward to that. Yes, me too. So yes, they can can hear more of my information on the podcast. They can go to my website, see my blog. And I'm very active also on social media. So they can go on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube and just use my handle, the at symbol, Dr. Sean Horn. Everything's Dr. Sean Horn. So if they just Google it, they'll find me. <laughs> Wonderful. And I'll put all the links in the show notes so they will have that there if they go to our show notes page. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Horn. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. To learn more about the work that Dr. Sean Horn is doing on shame and helping people heal, energize, and become aware of their own inner strengths, you can visit her website at drshawnhorn.com. You can also listen to her podcast, Inspired Living, or read her column called Connecting the Dots in Twa Magazine. I'll put all of the relevant links in the show notes. If you've missed any of this, you can dive into the show notes for this episode and all past episodes at www.brainshape.ca forward slash podcast. To access the show notes from today's episode specifically, just type episode 33 in the search bar and today's episode will pop right up. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that this episode gave you some important insights about how approaching your own experiences of shame from a place of curiosity and understanding will empower you to better cope with the vast array of emotions that are a normal part of our human experience. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you'll be notified every time we publish a new episode. And since we're a weekly show, I'll see you back here next week. In the meantime, you can follow me on social media at BrainShapeTO. 
And be sure to send me your brain health questions to my email, andrea at brainshape.ca. Until next time, keep your brain in shape. And as always, it's been such a pleasure hanging out with you.